Tonight, we're going to be talking about the book, The Book of Halloween by Ruth Edna Kelly. And since it is sort of our Halloween show, we thought we'd come dressed up. I'm uh, currently dressed up as successful. <laughs> Something I'm clearly not. Uh, Dean, what are you supposed to be, though? You can't tell? No, are you like pumpkin face or something? Or? No, I'm the Headless Horseman. Uh, I, I got to point something out. The Headless Horseman didn't have a head. That's a cheap pumpkin mask. Are you sure you, you don't want to change up maybe who you are? Do you want to see something really scary? Sure, why not? <laughs> this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> can i say the old ones are the best ones that's true the old twilight zone you want to see something really scary gag okay my favorite uh twilight zone is uh the howling man refreshment what happens in the howling man um so it starts off in like the current day right and um he is telling this maid not to remove this stick that he has across this little crook with little crooks on it it's like, you can't, whatever you do, do not move this stick from this. It's literally just a closet, right? And she's like, well, why? What's going on? And uh, so he tells her the story about how right after World War I, he was trekking through the Carpathian Mountains and comes across this uh, uh, monastery. And through the end of it, he ends up releasing the devil, the actual devil. Um, and so he dedicated and right after that is world war he's like then that's when world war ii happened so he spent the entire he spent the the rest of his life up to that point looking for satan looking for the actual devil to imprison him and then ship him back to uh you know to the to this monastery in the carpathian mountains oh wow i can't remember if i've seen that i thought i'd seen most of the twilight zones it's it is okay that one and then there's uh another one it's a the, the Christmas one may seem a little weird, but as we'll talk, there's actually a connection between Christmas and Halloween in America, at least. Um, it was one of the la- it was one of the later ones when they went over to uh, video cassette, right? And it actually had a very young uh, oh I just forgot his name. Um, he was in Jeremiah Johnson. Uh, uh, Luke Perry. Oh. N- <laughs> oh, I'm thinking of the new Jeremiah show. Jeremiah Robert Redford's yeah, in Jeremiah. Yeah, Robert Johnson. Redford. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, it Jeremiah very... Johnson. Ah, uh, gold. Yeah. Um, I'm only three people got that reference. Um, but anyway, yeah, yeah. It has this young uh, Robert Redford as a dying policeman. Right. Turns out he's actually death. So those are my two favorites. I mean, obviously you've got to serve man and uh, the one with the the. You know, the woman who's had the surgery and she thinks she's 
she's horrifically ugly turned you know and you know that one i forget the name of that one um the librarian uh mm-hmm. burgess meredith that's he a great is, one that's yeah. probably the best one they ever did yeah, because it's, it's not even really a it's not really a twilight it, it's it's the best kind of twilight zone it's not supernatural it's not it's just this is the future you're going you you could potentially be living in and that we probably are now and what's the but, another great one is that the monsters are due on mayberry street is that the title yes one? fantastic yes yeah we need to do a ha- I think we, yeah we should do a yeah, twilight zone we should do it yeah we that. should well we, we, we could probably just do specific episodes yeah because they're they're so good Pull you know you can't just them. leave them but anyway um that's that's what that's all we have great show thanks guys we'll, uh, we'll see y'all later <laughs> no no we, yeah we, we've got this really great uh very old book not very old because we're, we're going to be talking about stuff from like the 1500s uh in the coming days but yeah i mean this is you know it's from the night it's from literally published in 1919 mm-hmm. so it's one of the older book it's one of the older books that we've done but it's i mean really 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 good i think it's the so, first book length actual treatment yeah. of halloween i think it is uh that's yeah. what at least that's what i was reading up on uh particularly anything to involve uh america but i think it but everyone i read seemed to think this was the first proper halloween book uh not just a article here and there um but i have to admit um oh, i just forgot what i was gonna say I, I got distracted by that um oh the goblins normally Okay, so normally when I'm going into the, down into the mysterious library, right, to get one of these books, I end up having to, you know, throw candy at the, at, at the Oompa Loompas or I have to fight off one of the, you know, one of the elves or I have to do, dodge some monster or whatever. I'm thinking, okay, 1919, so it's in the lower chambers. It's Halloween, which means it's going to be with the gob- perfectly nice. The goblins were very, very nice. I was very surprised. And I felt really, really bad about using the the battle axe, um, considering <laughs> how polite they were. I mean, I it, it you're like, but if they were pl- here's the thing, man. If I'm taking a battle axe to a goblin, I feel like in, in the Lord of the Rings. I'm not saying I don't feel bad about it because they were perfectly pleasant. I'm just saying I like feeling like I'm in the Lord of the Rings more. That's all I'm saying. Well, it's in fairness to the goblins on that level, it is their time of the year. Halloween's the time of spooks and sprites. And we often today yeah. just think of the spooks. And that's one of the wonderful things about this book is that the sprites in the old spooks, I think that phrase is from um, Washington Irvin's, Irving's yes. um, Legend of Sleepy Hollow, the spooks and the sprites. Today, yep. we tend to just think about the spooks. Not many people think about or spooks the and spirits. Folk. Yeah, it's, they don't. Yeah, they yeah. don't think about the. They don't think about sprites meaning what was mm-hmm. the intention back then, meaning the fair folk, yeah. or the other crowd. But one of the wonderful things about this book is when you read it, if you had any doubt about the importance of the other crowd to the histories of of Halloween, and as the book points out, most of our Halloween beliefs come from the British Isles and some from Teutonic oh, countries yeah. as well, but primarily the British Isles. The mm-hmm. predominance of the belief that those entities were out on november eve as they called it in ireland or on all hallows eve or whatever you would like to to term it halloween is one of the things people were most concerned about it was a time of it was a time when those creatures were traveling as eddie lenehan often talks about who we covered a couple weeks ago often talks about how they're traveling between the forts between their summer and their winter residences. And she doesn't use that terminology in um, the book of Halloween, but Ruth uh, goes on to say that the forts are open and these things are out more on that night. So it's the same idea. Yeah. I mean, that's probably the first observation um, before we get into the actual book was since we just covered uh, Eddie Linehan's work on folklore from Ireland, specifically how often you read these stories and these poems and it's like, I, I know what she's talking about. I've, I've heard, right. I've heard the folk version of this or some, or it, it, it relates in some way to what was being said. So it's like, there's a lot of these recurring themes, like reading these, you know, ba- encountering these really back to back in sort of the way we have was very, it was very telling. Cause 
what she's dealing here, what Ms. Kelly is dealing with, is sort of is mythology, right? Which is which is different from folklore. I think this is one of those things where, um, particularly those of us who work in this this sort of field and genre, people don't always get the difference between mythology and folklore. And I think that's something we do need to keep in mind because they they are intertwined absolutely, but they're not the same thing. And those can be important differences so to see the folk version versus the sort of more official mythological interpretations was really interesting to put them side by side were there any was there any traditions that really jumped out to you in the book were there things you were like wow that's a tradition i'd never heard of before in the actual practices of halloween i mean yeah honestly the stuff that she's talking about halloween in america in 1919 Half those things, I'm like, what is she talking about? Like, okay, the okay, I was gonna say this one for later, but I think this is a good one. The holiday parade, one of the holiday, the Halloween parade in Fort Worth, where she, she let me go ahead and just read this quote. She says, "A far more interesting development of Halloween, of the Halloween idea, uh, again in the United States, it than these um, idea than these innocent but colorless superstitions is promised by the pageant at Fort Worth, Texas." on October 31st of 1916 in the mask and pageant of the afternoon 4000 of the afternoon 4000 school children took part at night scenes from the pageant were staged on floats which passed along the streets the subject was uh, preparedness for peace and comprised scenes from the uh, from american uh, american history sorry in which uh, peace played an honorable part such were the conference of William Penn and the Quakers with the Indians, the opening of the East to American trade. This is not a subject limited to performance at Hallowtide. May there not be written and presented in America a truly Halloween pageant, illustrating and befitting its noble origin and making its place secure among the holidays of the year. Um, again, we're probably going to talk more about the you know the, the games and things she talks about, but the thing that that stood out on this was. Her entire point of this pageant, right? This this pageant was that, hey, this is actually far more connected to the to the way Halloween was presented than any of these other things that we think of as Halloween, right? Dressing up, trick or treating, playing games, and it's like that's not what Halloween was in the old world. That's not what it's simple. It had nothing really to do with that. But this is probably more connect. But this idea of this pageantry and this parade of America's history is far more connected to it. So I, I mean, that really stood out to me the most. Um, again, aside from the really weird games with flour, and <laughs> I was like, man, people were really hard strapped for something to do, man. Well, Halloween sounds so great in America yeah. in the 19-teens. Like, I was mm -hmm. going to save it for later, but since we're talking about this period, maybe we'll maybe we'll travel back instead of traveling yeah. forward, which is probably mm -hmm. what we we assumed we were going to do. But I'll just yeah. I'll quickly it'll probably take me a minute because it's worth reading a little bit of this. I won't go as long as I would like to, but I think she she makes the interesting point about how when Halloween mm -hmm. receded in western europe in the british isles and the like it kind of came to prominence in america and again she's writing in the 19 teens right while the original customs of halloween are being forgotten more and more across the ocean americans have fostered them and are making this an occasion something like what it must have been in its best days overseas in other words yeah. we're really looking back in time now is what she's talking about yeah because she's just spent the entire book talking about all these mm -hmm. strange and esoteric traditions involving the other crowd yeah. and mm -hmm. ancient gods and weird fortune telling and the like. And then she goes on to say yeah. how it's all happening in America in the 19 teens. All Halloween customs in the United States are borrowed directly or adapted from mm -hmm. those other countries. All superstitions, everyday ones, and those pertaining to Christmas and New Year's have special value on Halloween. It is a night of ghostly and merry revelry mischievous spirits choose it for carrying off gates and other objects and hiding them or putting them out of reach so the old days trick-or-treating was far more yeah. far more hardcore than it is with little kids today like oh, teenagers stealing, be stealing your gate yeah. and putting it on the the roof of your barn anyway i won't read the quote which she quotes there but there's an example of it yeah. and she goes on to say bags filled with flour to your point about the the 
the involvement of flour. Bags filled with flour sprinkle the passers-by. Doorbells are rung and mysterious raps sounded on doors. Things thrown into halls and knobs stolen. Yeah, Such that... sports mean no more at Halloween mm -hmm. than the tricks played the night before the fourth of Ju for, b before the fourth of July have to do with the Declaration of Independence. We are manifested on all such occasions the spirits of free night, of which George von Hart, which speaks so enthusiastically mm -hmm. in St John's Fire, because in the old world. The classes, there was a night, and it's where carnival yes. comes from as well, mm -hmm. where the classes were kind of inverted, mm -hmm. where even if you were a servant, you could do whatever the devil you wanted to do. And that yeah. traveled to America for a while as well. I suppose yes. it's still there when people throw mm -hmm. toilet paper over trees and the like. Anyway, I'll get I'll get back to I'll I'll throw back to you yeah. in a tick, but let's just go a little further with this. Halloween parties it. are the real survival of the ancient merrymakings. And how cool do these sound? Listen. They are pre they are prepared for in secret. Guests are not to divulge the fact that they are invited. Often they come masked as ghosts mm -hmm. or witches. The decorations make plain the two elements of the festival. For the centerpiece of the table, there may be a hollowed pumpkin filled with apples and nuts and other fruits of harvest, or a pumpkin chariot drawn by field mice. Okay, so I've is, heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I never had. So well, it is clear. I've and only just for just for sure. I've heard of, I've never seen it done. I've never heard of anybody in the modern world, but I've heard of this thing, the the little pumpkin chariots drawn by field mice. I've heard of that before, but I've never even heard of it in connection with Halloween. It was it was some other connection, like yeah. Cinderella or something, right? Yeah. So it is clear that this is a harvest party, like Pomona's feast, and she spent a long time talking oh. about the old Roman, the old Roman tradition where they celebrated. Mm -hmm. Their fall festival was dedicated yeah. to the goddess Pomona, who was the goddess of the harvest. And that kind of merged with some of the old Gaelic traditions of Samhain and the like. We'll get to all that in a minute, though. Let's just keep going oh, yeah, yeah. and hearing how they celebrated Halloween 100 years ago in America, because there's a devil yeah. a lot different to how we celebrate it today. Mm. In the coach rides, a witch representing the other element of magic and prophecy. Jack-o'-lanterns with which the room is lighted are hollowed pumpkins with candles inside. We've kept that. That's about it. Yeah. Um, the candlelight shines through holes cut like features. So the lantern becomes a bogey and is held up at a window to frighten those inside. Corn stalks from the garden stand in clumps about the room. A freeze of witches on broomsticks with cats, bats, and owls surmounts the fireplace, perhaps. So some of the decorations are the same. A full moon shines over all, and a cauldron on a tripod holds fortunes tied in nutshells. The prevailing colors are yellow and black. So it wasn't orange and black a hundred years ago. It was yellow no. and black. So that's a change. A deep yellow, admittedly, mm -hmm. is the color of most ripe grain and fruit. Black stands for black magic and demoniac influence. Ghosts and skulls and crossbones, symbols of death, startle the beholder. Since Halloween is a time for lovers to learn their fate, hearts and other sentimental tokens are used to good effect as the Scotch lads of Burns' time wore love knots. So that's something when she was talking about an old Scottish Halloween ritual. And then she goes on. I mean, I could, it, it, in some ways, it gets more interesting, but she goes on to talk about about all of the type of games that people played yeah. involving fortune telling, which has oh, been yeah. lost now, which was so Entirely. common in the old world. And in America still, mm -hmm. people were doing weird things like roasting nuts on fireplaces and seeing what one popped first, whether it was going to be your lover or not, or going out into gardens at night and pulling out plants and seeing if there was, you know, if, yeah. if the cabbage had a lot of dirt on the roots of it, it meant that you were going to marry somebody wealthy. All these strange things which go back to the old, the old description. Brushing your hair in in the in the mirror at midnight. Yeah, yeah it's like all these weird, weird. Uh, some of the games too, where it's like, you know, you have names tied to, uh, you know, boys' names tied into in, the apples, and then you have girls' names over here. The boys and the girls would bob and you know for different apples. Um, some there's one thing where there's a stick with an apple and a bag of flour. You know, I mean. And candles that can burn you when you're trying to buy it and get the yeah. the apple. Yeah. Like like these things where they tie it and it's like candy and 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 then like you said, candles, and it's like if you it's just it's spinning around. Like these are some like you said, it's kind of insane games. Well, I the, just to go back to something you mentioned, which is fascinating, that ritual where a young woman 
would at midnight between October 31st and November 1st, which goes back to the old country, and people were still doing it in America, according to this book anyway, where she looks in the mirror, brushing her hair, and she does it X amount of times or something, and then she'll see over her shoulder the face of her future husband. That's almost like the weird Rosicrucian ritual where you stare into a mirror and you start yeah. to see faces. Like some of this ties into genuine occult practices and today we don't think this has we, we never consider any of this has to do with the way we celebrate halloween today so it's so interesting to see that it was still taken somewhat you know those old traditions were still being performed in the united states only a hundred years ago yeah, i exactly. mean it's, that I, to me that's the most fascinating part of the book i mean of course she she sets up that last chapter about America where she goes through almost every country you can imagine, even ones which don't celebrate Halloween but have similar traditions in Japan and in China. And so she goes all around the world looking at similar, you know, traditions about the day that the dead, you know, walk the earth or the day that the other world comes through when the veil is thin. But so by the time she gets to America, where today we all think about it as horror movie marathons and kids going trick or treating and maybe drunken college parties, right? Yeah. None of these old traditions, other than the remnants again of wearing a mask or carving a right. jack o' lantern, none of those actual mm -hmm. honest to goodness ritualistic traditions are still it survived we've lost that part of a, a, yeah. a deeper longer culture so i think that's one of the most fascinating things about the book and one of the saddest as well right. to see how it's all just you know blip gone well so okay yes and no um and what i mean by that is it's indicative of our culture evolving into its own right because cultures grow and evolve and you can see where and one of, the, one of the things going back to sort of the more the text of the book is you can see, you know, you have the British Isles, you've got Scotland, you've got Ireland, you've got the Welsh, you have these, um, you know, particularly very, very early on, these were different tribes with different cultures and beliefs and how they sort of, uh, you know, played and borrowed from each other, but then made each thing its own to her, to her point when it gets to America, that America's borrowed all of these things, Right. What we have seen now, and really, uh, this is a conversation probably to go into more detail in another show. There is very much an America before World War II and an America after World War II. You, you can even say World War I to a point. But definitely World War before World War II and after World War II, America is two very different places. And one of the things I think is that there is this push to create something new, right? And to be its own thing so while i agree that sort of connection to the old world disappears what we see is the evolution of something entirely new and and, and and it's what it's done is it sort of unifies around you know sort of it, it, it streamlines it and creates a new cultural norm and i think what it becomes it's indicative of the united states sort of becoming coming into its own changing sort of certain ideas um and standardizing some norms so yes to your point is there is there something lost yes is there something gained also yes it's a sort of a new unified thought um because it's indicative of america changing its role in the world and even how it views itself i mean it's you know we now again i do think there's some some things that were tied into that into those old older uh, practices that I think probably are also, you know, went by the wayside because of technology, right? Like if I, if some kid stole my doorknob, I'd beat the ever living tar <laughs> out of them, right? Um, there's a loss, there's a lack of regionalism as well. Like it, in the yeah. end, she talks about how this is big in Alabama, as you were saying, this they're doing in Texas, yes. this they're doing in mm -hmm. Maine. Right. So you're right, we've lost a lot of regional traditions. Yeah. But I think a lot of it has to do with the fantastic plastic elements of Halloween. In other words, there wasn't, yeah. no, there was no money to be made out of Halloween by corporations no. really back in mm -hmm. the 19 teens because the traditions were very much, you know, vegetables being carved and acorns or nuts being cooked on stoves and flour, right. you know, yeah. surprises. Well, today, Halloween, like Valentine's Day, like Christmas, like every holiday you can think of here, Easter has become primarily just about how do we sell more candy? How do we sell more costumes? Mm -hmm. And there's a sanitization of culture. So I agree, you're right. We've 
you could say whether we've evolved or devolved, we've moved as a culture. But yep. it is this very homogenized, okay, so on Halloween, and today it even it's not even always Halloween night because some counties mm -hmm. or some cities will go, we're actually doing Halloween on the Saturday night this year. So the kids are trick-or-treating between 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock on Main Street. So there's this weird, there's this very there's a sanitization which I think mm -hmm. robs the cultural traditions. And if how it's still fun for kids. Like, I mean, my daughter loves Halloween mm -hmm. because you get to dress up and you get to knock on doors and you get to ask for candy. And what other night of the year do you get to do that? But at the same time, those vestiges of this is the night where, you know, we're careful of the fair folk, or this is the night when we remember the dead, or this is the night yeah. where we're grateful for the, the success of the harvest and we're prepared for yeah. the worst of the winter, all of those old traditions, because you're right, we're not as tied to the land, it's mechanized, it's modernized, but it yeah. also just all shunts in or just all, you know, kind of mm -hmm. it's driven into this one clean, homogenized corporate version where it's just about who can sell the most candy and who can sell the cheapest costumes and, you know. How yeah. much does how much can Walmart buy the the cool costumes from China this year and make you know an eighty percent you know upsell to all the little kids who want to wear whatever's cool this year? So it's lost. It, commercialism really has stripped back the, the meaning of Halloween. There's no doubt we've lost right. a lot of what it used to mean. Well, but but even the entire idea of Halloween is an American concept. I mean that's that's sort of the other really the other thing. Probably the better takeaway here is that it's very much an American concept that actually blends a lot of thoughts together, which is the entire point of the book, which is why she starts off in Ireland, mm -hmm. going backwards and saying, hey, let's look at some of these older traditions. Again, it's one of the reasons I liked that line about Fort Worth, aside from the fact that it's Fort Worth, is that she says, no, 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 this is probably closer to what a, a real Halloween thing would be if you were to go back again to Ireland. Because and this is uh, one of the things I wanted to, I, uh, one of the things I wanted to address, if I can find my mouse, there it is. Um, let me pull it up real quick. Um, where'd it go? Do, 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 do. I mean, yeah, obviously we've got, um, you know, the, the supernatural stuff and that's all right. And we'll definitely we'll talk about that. Right. Um, but it, it was the idea that November 1st, right? This sort of October 31st, November 1st time, time period. Because I'd always heard uh, Sam Hain as the name of a, a person or a spirit, but it's like it just means summer's end. Right. Well, right. I think I think this this is one of the problems with the book, just to correct yeah. you as well. Is no, she no, yeah. she kind of she does a section on, on Samhain, right? Or Sam Hain as it's spelled, but right. Samhain. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. she does say that's just the summer's end festival. And then later she talks mm -hmm. about the Lord of the Dead Sam Han and she spells it differently. Yeah. But right. Sam Han is Samhain. So right. I think well, it's through her scholarship back then, which I'm, yeah. and, I mean, she's done an amazing job, but what was the, what was available for her to, to put this book together by, by mm -hmm. you know, a, a female librarian who lived in Maine in the 19 teens compared to now when we have the internet. So I, when I was reading that, I was like, that's weird because you're calling, and it was the festival of that period, but it was also right. the festival of the Lord of the dead. It's the same right. thing. Well, so you're does, right. She can, she, but she, yeah. she separates the two and then they shouldn't be she separated because it's the well, same thing. She, she separates them, but she also explains how they became the same thing. I, I, I think, okay, so this would be a critique because I agree with you. I think obviously she, she has very limited material to what we would have today. So mm -hmm. that's, I'm giving her that, but I do think, and I, like I said, I kind of want to go back to the beginning of the book here in a second, because she, she makes a really interesting point about the sun, about this really being connected to worship of the sun um but again she does say look sam hay meaning summer's end you're right she starts off there but she does show how it becomes connected to the idea of the of it being the lord of the dead right how do we get there i think the fact that she starts at it being summer's end and then she sort of explains it. i do think she could have done a better job to say this is where it started and this is in We'll explain the process of how it becomes the Lord of the Dead, right? But she does. But she does and again. Whether it's correct or not is another conversation. Ultimately, but she ties it into the the fact that they believed. Again, how accurately this is, I, I do feel like she did a lot of jumping around culturally mm -hmm. on to get to this point. Is that it was the you know that the winter months was the death of the sun, right? And I felt like she did go a, a little 
uh, far astray to prove that point. I'm like, yeah, you know, but again, it is what it is. But she and she uses that idea and say, well, this is summer's end. And so because of this, I, this concept of the death of the sun um, and the thinning of the veil with the other side, uh, which again is a topic we'll talk about here in a second. That's how it became, you know, the idea that Sam Hain was the Lord of the dead and that this it, she's she's marking this this evolution from this point to a. Um, Get to get to the American Halloween because the entire point of the book is how do we get the American Halloween a la 1919? And so she's marking the sort of evolution of this idea. Um, so I'm I, so I, I'll do a little bit of a pushback on your critique there only because I do I see where she's going. I would art, I would, however, also say I agree with you because again, maybe it's due to just her access to what scholarship she had right at the time. Yeah. That may very well be the point. I do because I do think she's she because she's predicating all this on the idea that the sun is the center of worship ultimately in this entire exchange. Yeah. And that that connection, some of the connections she makes with Egypt just feels a little tenuous. But what are your thoughts on that? I I, I mean, I think you're being kind. I mean, I love this book. I mean, I'm so grateful yeah. this book was written, but I think you're being kinder to her than than this point deserves. I actually mm -hmm. think my reading of the book was mm -hmm. that she had referenced these in different places and had read different yeah. manuscripts with different spellings and didn't identify them as the same thing. That was my reading of the book because when right. she talks about Sow and later or Sam Han, as she spells it, as opposed to Sam Hain, it's both Sow mm -hmm. and it's almost to me like she doesn't understand they're related and she starts a new tradition here. Well, it's the same tradition, but maybe I misread it. Maybe you're right. Mm -hmm. And she was, um, she was more on point than maybe than maybe we thought. So I think, the, I think the problem is we're both right to a point. Um, maybe she was wrong. Maybe we both are. But she yeah. was well, it, okay. So I'm I, I I may be a little overly generous. I, I may be a little overly generous. Generous. You may be a little over uh, analyzing, but because I I think she, and this is definitely a difference from. Um, uh, I think this may be a big difference in sort of her uh the approach modern day writing takes to what she was doing okay because i think she kind of ex again my reading of the book i think she kind of expected us to make those connections ourselves and to see that i think she kind of expected her pe the people who were reading this to understand those connections because i'm going to be honest we were more literate people back in 1919 than we that's are today true. that's very true and it's not just, and I don't mean literally in just that the ability to read words, but the ability to think through these things. And we are, again, post-World War II, our writing is much more direct. We spell everything out. We do not leave anything, you know, to uh, uh, up for interpretation where she does. And I and I agree with you. If she, I, I still think even with that, though, she should have made a more conscious choice yeah. to connect those thoughts. I that think she I, doesn't do that. Something so, similar absolutely. she does. Sometimes she goes back and repeats the same yeah. rituals in different chapters because she's looking. And it's it's almost like um, I took it all. I, it felt to me almost as much as, again, I love the book. In some ways, it felt like it was different essays joined and there wasn't. Now you're yeah. right. The American mm -hmm. chapter at the end definitely ties it all together. But some of the chapters mm -hmm. don't perhaps make don't yeah they 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 don't need mm -hmm. to repeat things again which we read only 20 pages before we get the idea that you know this mm -hmm. ritual happened in ireland where you know girls threw i don't know like apple peels over their shoulders to see the 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 yeah. name the initials of their future husband and then she'll talk about the same ritual exactly you know 20 pages later it's like why is I, so i wonder if originally it was a selection of essays and she edited it together and i mean who knows i don't actually know but it's right. a wonderful book anybody with any interest yeah. in halloween should read this book oh well, any interest in history should really read this because it's she again is she you know have we probably expanded on a lot of these topics we have better arch, you know better archaeology better better history more access yes all of that is true that being said this is still valuable 
Um, in fact, one of the w- several things that she talked about in the book that I thought was really interesting was this idea that this is about a you know, we tend to think of harvest, right? Seasons being a harvest thing. She's like, no, these were pastoralists. That's why October 31st becomes a thing. This is about the pasture. This is not about harvest time. It's about pasturing, which I, is an entirely different thought. And the idea that this is all connected to the, the idea of the sun, worship of the sun, that this is where the sun starts to die. And also, the, and also I think we lose in our, in our modern Western culture, we think of New Year's Eve, right? We think of New Year's is happening later in the, in the, in the winter, which is, you know, January 1st, but for, and again, this is my brain making this pastoral connection. For them, it was October 31st. Well, that's not too mm-hmm. dissimilar from the Hebrew calendar, right? Because the Hebrew calendar, again, is, is a, it's different, but it's usually, you know, between September and October is when the, is when the Hebrew New Year begins. From a, a uh, you know, there's the religious New Year, which is, which is what we would call Easter or Passover. Uh, but then their civic calendar begins in the, in the fall. But that's a pastoral idea. Like that's not an agricultural idea; it's a pastoral idea. So I found that really, really interesting that she she doesn't make the Hebrew connection, but she points this out, right? And this is something that I think we lose in modern contexts. Yeah, and it probably it probably differs from culture to culture as well. Of course, a lot mm-hmm. as we mentioned before, a lot of these traditions were Roman traditions blending with older Celtic yeah. or Gaelic traditions. So certainly, the idea that winter meant the or, or November Eve or October 31st or Samhain or Halloween or whatever we Mm -hmm. want to call it. Certainly that Mm -hmm. meant that here winter was, this is the, you know, this is the end of one year and a new year is beginning. It certainly had that centrality Mm -hmm. to play. What else I've always found about fascinating about Halloween since I've moved to the North Woods is in Australia, I loved Halloween, but you never felt it had any seasonal significance. It wouldn't have mattered what day of the year it really was because Sydney just gets, you know, slightly right. colder and a lot hotter. It doesn't have this massive seasonal change like America. Yeah. But here when mm-hmm. Halloween drops, like in the last week or two, it drops dead on time. Like the seasons, you're very conscious. Mm-hmm. Okay, I better have the firewood in. It's going to snow soon. I've got to have had all my harvest in or the frost would have killed it. I hope those pumpkins yeah. still turn orange because they don't have much longer and they're going to, they, We I can't protect them from frost that much longer. You're very conscious yep. of this change in season. Throw hunting into the mix, which everybody does in this part of the world. Throw like, you know, deer mm-hmm. season in. And there's this very seasonal pattern of harvesting and gathering and bringing in the food. Yep. Which mm-hmm. which is, which to, to be honest, where, whether you lived in Australia or whether you lived in a city, perhaps even in the United States, perhaps even in the Midwest, sure, you'd be mm-hmm. conscious nights were getting longer, but you wouldn't be conscious of that immediacy of, oh, I better have my, I better have my crops in. I yeah. Better my shoot survival. That deer. Yeah. Yeah. It's, my survival it's depends on my stuff, ha- being having all my stuff together. Yeah, Absolutely. So I and I, I love that about the holiday here. I love the, the the way that it really does mark the end of the summer. I'm yeah. very conscious of it. I'm more conscious of Halloween here now than I ever was in Australia. As much as I celebrated and enjoyed it in Australia, it didn't have any ancestral or genetic, you know, mm-hmm. resonance on a real level. It just had an ancestric an ancestral, mm-hmm. I guess, resonance. And I know culturally this is what we did, but when you live in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly right. when you live north mm-hmm. in the Northern Hemisphere, like on those same kind of, you know, yep. on that same kind mm-hmm. of latitude as people in people in England and Scotland and Wales and Ireland. And as you notice, they're the places she really focuses in on. on the oh, book. yeah. And while we're there, that's something else worth talking about is how similar and there are some differences, but how similar the beliefs and the traditions are in that different parts of the British Isles, which makes sense mm-hmm. when you're a more modern right. culture. But when you're looking at something which was, you know, over a thousand years ago in some cases, it's it's interesting to wonder how those cultural connections, those cultural mm-hmm. traditions of fortune telling and finding out who your husband was going to be and the idea that this is the night that the veil was down, how it resonated so much throughout that whole part of the world or just that unique part of the world, the British Isles, really. Well, okay. So 
I do actually know a little bit about this. And by the way, yes, Bridget, uh, y'all are so again because of the Hispanic uh, heritage aspect of that. You are celebrating the Mexican Day of the Dead, actually. And interestingly, um, she talks about that in this book yeah. because because mm -hmm. Catholic countries, the importance yeah. of All Saints Day and All Souls Day, and it was celebrated yep. differently in those countries. In fact, yeah. this is before there would have been an obvious Day of the Dead presence in America back then. Mm -hmm. Now it's a much bigger presence. She talks about in right. the book how in those countries, particularly in Spain, she even mentions yeah. graves are decorated. You know, you welcome the dead to your table at night. It does, it, while there was a consciousness, there was a similar similar idea that the veil was down between this world and the other world it wasn't so much about fearful that the dead might look in or trying to scare them away it was more about almost welcoming them and celebrating them or praying for their souls yes. to get out of purgatory mm -hmm. or to escape the devil it had a very yeah. different it, it although it was the same date it had very different celebrations and very different mm -hmm. significances attached to it in in the teutonic european world and in the british isles and it did in places like Spain, for example, right? Or oh, France. Yeah. so so it just brings me right back to the original to that original point about why the British Isles. It's like, yes, you're right. You go back a thousand years, and you know you, you do expect there to be a little bit more regional variants, but we do need to remember sort of the history of that whole area, right? It's again, the British Isles, which includes Ireland, is, I mean, they're still really small, right? I mean, like. If you were to put Ireland and, and Britain together and plop them down in Texas, it's like, oh, yeah, it's tiny. It's tiny, you know, and, and, and we have to remember, again, the different waves of migration forced a, of. That's a good point. Of, of, you know, the Anglo, you know, the. <laughs> Okay, well, the Celts and the, the Celts carried a lot of this stuff initially. Right. So you're right. There's a big Celtic yeah. influence in it's a Celtic Scotland influence. and in Ireland, or Gaelic, whatever. So in right. Scotland and in Ireland, like mm -hmm. the Gaelic speaking people, parts of part, even yeah. probably, I, I think there was some Gaelic speaking in Wales as well, right? So that that part yeah. of the world probably did have. You're right. Did have similar traditions. It's still fascinating right. to think that people mm -hmm. who had never travelled between the two places. It was, you know, it, it, not that it was a monoculture, but it still is interesting to see that spread between, yeah, you know, in, in these different parts of the British Isles. And incidentally, no, of course, she also talks about, um, <clears throat> she also talks about the the smaller islands that surround, which are outside of places like Scotland, and mm -hmm. some of their traditions, which are very yep. similar as well. So yeah, it had spread. And you're right, it was probably that original Gaelic influence which had, you know, taken these right. things. All right, because they're they're the first ones. Then you have the Anglo Saxons, and you have the Romans, the Anglo Saxons, and of course the Vikings. The it's Normans, like you, yeah, yeah, the Normans. It's like you, you have several that push things around. But again, we're talking about thousands, literally thousands of years of intercultural uh, contact. Again, we tend to think, you know, when you think about the differences, like you said, the differences between Spain and and France, right? Like those are those are much further apart they have there's much more separating them because water is not as big of a separator as people tend to think right it's mountains that are really the number one thing that keep cultures separated in vast distances but yeah to your point there but she did point out the regional differences like there were different interpretations they just weren't as different but she does point out again why does and i think yeah this going back to the previous point like why alabama why does alabama maintain this very well because Again, well, where did all the Irish get shipped by the British, right? To the south. They were the they they were the first slaves in America. They were, you know, we call them indentured servants today. That's a whole different kettle of fish. But like they were the first ones here. They were the, they were being shipped over here. The Celts came to the south. That's really where the word cracker came from. It was about the Celts. It was the, they were the poor Celts that came they were shipped over here to to do the work for the British. Like that's where this all sort of started. So it's interesting that we see again why does again the evolution of Halloween here in America the reason it ties so so tightly to the Irish traditions and not just the British Isles in general but specifically to Ireland is because of the literally millions of Irish that came over as indentured servants and slaves and you know just because Britain's like well we gotta we got you know you, you don't live very long in the South in Virginia. <laughs> You know, because of disease, let's just start shipping all these people we don't want over there. Plus, the Scots, like this uh, again. Uh, you know, the the British, are like, well, we need all this land to graze our sheep. Let's just force a couple million Scots 
had terrible stuff in, in boats over to America. So of course we came, we came here, uh -huh. right? And we brought those ideas with us and those traditions, and that's why we got here. But going back to that original point, right of the of the traditions, one of the things I I did see and I wanted to mention, um, was you know again this idea of it being the first of the year is like that's when people would sign up to either. You know, they would say, okay, this is the person I worked for for the year. I'm either going to go on to some and work with someone else or I'm going to sign back on with you, those kinds of things. Um, there was this uh, comment uh, where you should get the Tuatha Dadana, right? Mm -hmm. um, which again, we just got through with uh, Eddie Amen. Linehan. Yeah. So it's like, oh, hey, you know, it's these are the people of the goddess Dana. Well, she was talking about how, again, these supernatural spirits that they're sort of the irish version of the fey are, are sort of these tuatha de Danann, right however the thing that really stood out to me and maybe i'm reading more into, i don't think she she intends this at all so let me this is me but this sort of stood out when she was talking about their fight right with these uh you know the with these uh four more mm -hmm. for more to these more, sea yeah. demons yeah the, the, that came destroying it's interesting, it? but after destroying nearly all their enemies by plagues exacted from those remaining as tributes, a third part of the corn, a third part of the milk, third part, you know, on and on. This tax was paid on Sam Hain. So again, she's connecting this, these Femur coming to them, but it talks about, you know, that the Femur destroyed their enemies by plagues and, and etc. It, it just got me thinking, it's like, it is on Sam Hain that you were, that the, that the, the Tuatha de Dain and all them would pay their, their, taxes right or their tributes to these for more there's something about this the way she phrases this and again my brain probably overworking right this sounds very very similar to uh the danoi or the or the tribe of dan um for those who may not know uh it's kind of a small you know thing in archaeology Again, we have to remember that when we're reading about Moses and Jacob and the cleansing of the Levant and all of that, right? This is er this is the early Bronze Age. Like this is just around the time of the Bronze Age collapse. So this is many, many thousands of years ago. The tribe of Dan, of the twelve tribes of of Israel, the tribe of Dan was a seafaring tribe. There are a number of people who believe that it, when you read the Iliad, they talk about the Danoi that that's actually the tribe of Dan and that they were merchants. They went out, that they were seafarers. And again, because I, and because I've, I've, I cannot say too much about this. If you listen to the true history of the Romani, because the Romani people will, will not tell you the true history unless they like you, like they have these false stories that they tell, then there's the real story. It is entirely possible that the Dan, that these, the tribe of Dan, you know, was a lot of, did a lot of seafaring. They may have even opened up trade with the British Isles, which again, they talk about the Tin Isles, right? Where that's where they got the tin for the Bronze Age or one of the access, because tin was actually harder to come by than copper. There's just something about the way she phrased that about how they had used plagues to, you know, oversee their, their enemies. It's like, this just feels like, there is some sort of weird Hebraic connection here. Then maybe this foam, not the not the you know Duwatha uh, Danan. I'm not Dewey Dana. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. I don't think that's the. I don't think they're the tribe of Dan. I think the Fomor may be that connection. Again, it's not a name connection. It's a this connection to the plague being this thing that 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 they use on their enemies. It just it huh. feels so connected to egypt and the in the exodus event i it just again probably my brain overworking it's interesting i was just reading it, i'm like this is a really interesting connection for some reason and again why are they coming on sam hain why are they coming at the end of the of the summer because that's really when the waters well because that's the beginning of this of their civil year right to the hebrew people that's the that's the new year and again, that connection to that pastoral lifestyle, it just, a bunch of things sort of attacked. I have no way of knowing if any of that's true. I will actually have to, I'm actually going to try and look into it. But there was something about what she said, I, the way I was like, huh, that's just, it just stood out. That's all. That is interesting. See, the, maybe Random you should look into it more. Maybe, yeah, maybe you should look into it more because the prehistory of 
of mm-hmm. Ireland in many ways. Well, some people say it doesn't have a creation story and some people say, well, that's not true, but essentially mm-hmm. it's about waves of migration and yeah. the previous race battling the next race. So, yeah. I mean, if there was a, a lost tribe sailing around, maybe they did get to Ireland and were one of those waves of, of immigration. As we mm-hmm. both know, often, often mythology has mm-hmm. – it's a tenant can be something based on facts. So if there were these different cultures clashing, yep. who knows? I don't know. I do. I mean, I love the, I love the backstory of the, the, the tour to Dan. And then I love the, the story yeah. of the actual, the Gaelic people, you know, mm-hmm. finally getting there and battling with the tour to Dan and reaching some kind of impasse. And then, or maybe they won at any rate, that was when the tour to Dan and went underground yeah. or, you know, went to mm-hmm. the other world and became the fair folk or the fairies or the good neighbors. So it's something which, mm-hmm. which I take both literally and not literally. I love the idea of a supernatural race, which, you know, has coexisted yes. in Ireland for, for thousands of years. And it's interesting mm-hmm. how of all the countries in the world where there has been that story of that other hidden supernatural race it Mm -hmm. only really still still holds any i suppose cultural currency in ireland and to a lesser degree in iceland where there was there were where there were some waves of irish immigration anyway with the with the hulden folk or the hidden folk in isle in Mm -hmm. iceland so it's interesting that there's something about those places where they're still taken seriously that there's still this supernatural race coexisting it's whether it's true or not it should be true because it's such and that's what i like to that's Mm -hmm. why this book i love so much as well because it talks about the importance of both the tour to Dannon and then later the our conception of fairies. And it, she does, mm-hmm. you're right, she talks about the difference between Irish fairies and Scottish yeah. fairies, how in Scotland mm-hmm. they tend to be far nastier for the most part. And she links that to the fact that, that Scotland has, you know, the landscape is, you know, more rougher and there's more you know yes. mountainous regions mm-hmm. and deeper forests. So the 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 other creatures there were far you know more mm-hmm. malevolent perhaps than the the fairies in yep. in in ireland but the idea that that part of the world had this belief for so long and in ireland you know a lot if you if you take eddie lenehan at any kind of face value the irish still or big big swathes of the irish still take yeah. the fairies very seriously one last little rabbit trail that's not really connected to the text at all. Now, I do want to talk about the text for like two seconds, but since we're coming so close to the end, the thing between Eddie Linehan's work and and this book, I it keeps I, all I'm think I keep thinking of Joshua Kutchin's work with Bigfoot and connecting him to the Fae because where do the Fae live outside of this other the, on this other side? There's this in the earth, right? There seem there seems to be this re- repetition of in the earth language well we see that a lot with a lot not all but a lot of bigfoot stories right like oh they're in the earth they have these you know now they're they're it's materialized like are there these tunnels underneath the earth that we just don't know about and that's where they go to right they, it's like but that's not that far a, a, a separation no, right it's very similar. And it, it popped up in this book again i was saying it's like you know what i just just done with Eddie Linehan. We're, I'm I'm seeing this in this book, and that made me think of Joshua Kutchin. And I'm like, yeah, it's a lot of. I'm I'm still holding on. I'm still holding on to my theory that there's a, a purely natural, but that a lot of this is. But I'm gonna be honest, Dean. You're 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 winning me over. These 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 books are starting to make me think that you may be more right. Oh, than, I'm uh, glad. Or it might be the good neighbors themselves trying to get your attention. Right. Well. And I'll smack around a good neighbor or two. I wouldn't say that. I mean, I'm. Hey, he I, said uh, he. Wait, Lord of the wait. Rings, man, I got a battle axe that needs. He he said that, not me. <laughs> yeah, like, you go talk to those to those mysterious library goblins. I'll I'll walk into Mordor. Um, but back to the actual text, and I mean the actual text itself. The th- again, the book is full of a lot of great content. Again, we've talked about that. And it's, it's just love, quickly too, it's perfect yeah. reading for this time of the year. Like people well, really should is. read this yeah. right. It's the same way I'd like to read Christmas Carol by Dickens at, you know, mm-hmm. at Christmas time. This is the perfect book and it's pretty quick reading. Like you can knock it off in a day or so easily. Yeah, this like, is, immerse yourself. 
Yeah, I read this in a day. I'm telling you, try, I, I'm a slow reader. This was not, and you can get it for free. Like you can go, yeah. I got it from the Project Gutenberg ebook. Like it's, you can just type it in. You can get it for free as a PDF, as an ebook. Like it's, this is a, this is an easy book to get. It's an easy book to read. But again, back to the text. I just love how it read. Because she has that early turn, again, that sort of turn of the century. It's a little more literate. It's a little more, it's a softer text, right? And I just love that. It was, the, there was an aesthetic to how she used language that I, I absolutely loved. It was just, it was a pleasure to read. So much of the stuff we write, today, and I mean, even going back to the 70s, has a very um, in-your-face sort of newspaper, very blunt, you know, direct presentation. This was a lot more eloquent. It was a lot more, it was a lot more softly given, you know, it was, there's a little bit more artistry to how she used the language that I loved. Yeah, her, her librarian way shines through, I think. You can imagine yes. her being an mm -hmm. early 20th century librarian going through whatever resources she had to do justice to the history that she, she yes. wanted to outline. No, it was it was absolutely wonderful. Um, one last thought, because I know you had a, a passage you wanted to read before we left. Um, the one last thought, I, I, I again, I would have never made this connection, but she does. How, you know, we've talked, we sort of danced around this which is which is not an intended joke but if you read the book you'd understand that there's a definitely a joke there um about how in our version of halloween the because the entire premise of the book is how do we get halloween in america because it is its own unique thing but that our halloween is very much an amalgamation of sam hain and these these sort of these you know harvest festivals but also christmas and you're like what Christmas was also a time of telling ghost stories and of, to your point, like Carnival running around causing mischief and mayhem and not necessarily caring, you know, who's of the upper class and who's of the lower class. This is, that's a more traditionally Christmas idea. And going door to door, caroling or mumming as they yeah. did in England, mm -hmm. asking for things. There's oh, yeah. that tradition as well, which we don't do that really that often at Christmas mm. anymore, at yeah. least in America. But we did it at both of those occasions in the past. So there, there mm -hmm. is a big connection. We think of Christmas as the big winter festival now, but mm -hmm. way back in the day, Samhain was the big winter festival. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, think about the carol, you know, um, Oh, what is it? Um, we wish you a Merry Christmas, right? We like go and look at the later verses of that song. It's like, bring us figgy pudding, bring it right now. And I'm like, first of all, who just has figgy pudding right, laying around? But then, but that was the entire point was if you didn't bring them something, they were going to screw up your house. Yeah. They yeah. were going to trash your house, man. Like, again, this whole idea of trick or treat is literally a Christmas idea that we've put on halloween because for those of you who do not know christmas was not originally celebrated in the united states it was seen as a pagan both it was actually seen both as a catholic but then also as a pagan thing and it was not done by polite society because of all of the because of the shenanigans of the the, the shenanigans so that again go you bang on people's doors asking for figgy pudding you like know what kind of what kind of criminal does that <laughs> speaking of figgy pudding i'm glad you brought that up because it was a point i wanted to make Mm -hmm. Many of the traditions which were associated with Samhain or with Halloween or with November Eve in the book from the British Isles, mm -hmm. I'd actually celebrated in Australia at Christmas or at other times of the year. For example, yeah. my grandmother always made Christmas pudding, which was related to your figgy pudding. Yeah. And in that, there would always be a sixpence put. And in this book, they talk about baking cakes and making other food where mm -hmm. when you were the person who got the ring or the coin or whatever it right. was, it had an actual fortune telling significance. Now, when we were little, it was only, oh, cool, I've got the sixpence or whatever it was, right? Mm -hmm. But traditionally, that went back to an old tradition where it actually was meant to signify something about the person who got the coin. The right. throwing the apple peels over one's shoulder or whatever it was mm -hmm. to find out what shape the letter uh, the peel might have made was the shape of your future husband or wife. That was something we did when we were kids as well. That was a tradition in Australia. 
they talk, I don't, I'm trying to remember if she talked about reading tea leaves, but she talked about things like that, about seeing patterns yes. in things, right? That oh, was yeah. something else that my grandmother was interested in when I was a kid. I'm aware of that happening as well. So all of these traditions had filtered down from the old world. I don't think they're carried on hardly at all, all anymore. I mean, no, I, not I'm not making I'm not making a pudding and putting a sixpence in it. I'm not peeling apples with my daughter and showing her how to show throw the peel and to find out the initial of a husband. And I'm not making tea the old fashioned way and trying to read the tea leaves and see what the significance of the pattern is. So while they're yeah. all linked to Halloween in this, they weren't linked to Halloween in my experiences in Australia, but the traditions were mm -hmm. still still just there back in the 70s and perhaps the well, early 80s. Okay, so again, slightly off topic, but also on the idea of Christmas crackers, which I miss that we did that all the time to, in Australia. To the Americans, I do not mean the flat wafers that you eat. They are, I only know about them because I watch Doctor Who. But these, they are these tubes. They're they're like decorated like a a, a paper, like a shiny paper, uh, different colored patterns and stuff. And you you break them, and they have. Sometimes I, I guess some have toys, but most often they have like, um, like fortune cookie. Like honestly, it's like a paper version of a fortune cookie, where they'll have quotes or whatever. Yep. But they and they have, have funny fortune. hats in them, paper hats you put on. Yeah, and they might have a whistle, or they might have some other funny toy. They might have a joke. They might have. You're right. They can have anything from fortunes to riddles to, you know, anecdotes to, and they they do resemble a fortune cookie in that capacity. I miss them here mm -hmm. in America. It was one of my favorite traditions of Christmas Day, popping yeah. or cracking the, the the Christmas cracker with the person sitting next to you at the family table. Yeah, we left all that in the old world, like all the other degenerate European things. <laughs> well, you know what I um, think it was? I think it's when when America threw off British rule, and thank goodness they did. A lot of those British traditions were thrown yeah. overboard as well. And some of the British traditions that were only becoming popular around that time, which I grew up with, like Boxing Day. This is a bit yeah. of a tangent as well. I say to people here, oh, it's Boxing Day today, the day after Christmas. People are like, yeah. what? Boxing Day? Yeah, Boxing Day. They have no, A lot of people I've mentioned it to have no idea about the existence of that holiday at all. Yeah, exactly. Because you're right. That is some, I think that's something that sort of did evolve post America breaking away. But again, even Christmas, our entire idea of how Christmas is celebrated in the modern world is in, is almost entirely born out of, again, in reference to what you mentioned earlier, uh, Charles Dickens. I mean, Charles Dickens basically created this idea of modern Christmas. I mean, again, the Christmas that we celebrate is only like 120, 140 years old, all things considered. I mean, it is. A lot of these traditions are brand new. And Coca-Cola Coca invented Santa, as we know him today as well. I mean, that's the image of Santa. Yeah, is yeah the image of Santa. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, again, yeah. So, again, so many of these things are, are again, we, it's funny. That a lot of things we think of as traditional are literally just post-World War II or at best post-World War One. I. I mean, it's. Again, going back to something we mentioned earlier, the Amer the the version of Halloween we celebrate today is very different from what it was in 1919, but it's it's only because it's part of this whole revolution of America sort of growing up with this uh, again post World War II. We've created this whole new identity, um, and sort of you know in in, in Halloween the way we celebrate Halloween, the way we celebrate Christmas, these are all ex expressions of this. And it's interesting that we took a lot of these different. Some things we think of as Christmas, some things we think of as uh, she even talks about the, you know, certain May Day sort of traditions all got put on Halloween. It's like we're like, OK, so Halloween's the naughty holiday. We'll put that here. So we'll take all the weird stuff that you do on these other holidays. We'll put them on this one. And then Christmas is the good holiday. And then fire. Then we already have July, July 4th where we get to blow crap up. So <laughs> we're all good. You know what, quickly too, because I think this is important, and I would like to read something before. Well, yep. you can sign out first, then I'll read it. But I think one of, I think you make a very good point that somewhere between perhaps World War One and World War Two, things changed radically. And part mm. of the reason of that, particularly with a, with a festival, which is essentially a harvest festival, like we've been talking about, or even a pastoral festival, yep. anything rural, is there's an increasing, there's an increasing urbanization in America, particularly oh, yeah. from about the Great Depression onwards, and certainly post-World War II. America used to be, you can even 
see it when you watch old Disney cartoons or old, old mm-hmm. any old cartoon from anywhere from the 1920s to the 1940s to mm-hmm. see how the audience they were aiming at was rural. Like all yeah. of these adventures the characters were having were rural. They lived in rural areas. They did rural things. Now – we don't think of America as a no. predominantly rural nation anymore, even though thankfully there's still a big rural component. But when you have a festival which is so focused on harvest and so focused, as I was saying before, on the awareness of what the changes in season means to anybody with a farm or a garden or who wants to hunt and get his meat in for the winter, when you strip all of that those touchstones away with the changing of the seasons, which is what this holiday was based on going all the way back again to whether it's, whether it's Roman rituals of the harvest or whether it's sow and, or whether it's the worship of the sun and being conscious that the sun's going to become less and less. All of those things are based very much on a rural existence. And when it becomes an urban existence, some of those things are no longer as significant. Yeah. I mean, even again, going back to your Disney metaphor then I'll, then we'll let you uh i'll let you sign us out with your with your poem reading um even if you look at the like these more i haven't seen the last couple because my kids are finally old enough i don't need to care about them um you know but it's like like frozen right even though a lot a lot of that does take place in sort of more almost all of the context and in context are within a city right tangled Almost all of that, again, rural, pastoral, everything has sort of a city context to it. The stuff that happens in nature is to and from a point. Like, that's the stuff that happens in between that moves the story along. Even when, like in uh, Frozen, when she goes and they talk to to uh, to the trolls, right? The little rock troll things. Even that's kind of city esque, right? It's not really. A connection to the pastoral so that's a, that's an interesting point we'll need to explore it on another uh on another show yeah it's not a bad idea i was nodding like i knew what you meant i've never seen frozen and i never will it's you're better off trust me. <laughs> and i listen i'm somebody yeah. who loves the old disney the new disney is just like man this is just so trash. uninspiring it doesn't seem to resonate with me at all so don't don't ever get me started on the on the uh, on the live action aladdin remake oh don't I, I i i got a chance to see it because I was working, I did some work with a website and so I was reviewing it. Don't ever get me started on that. That's an hour of, uh, it's at least a half, at least half an hour of me talking about why Disney no longer, like the people doing that have no idea how movies even work, much less, much less musicals. But that's, that's a rant for another day. It's just, it's just about selling toys. It's just about like today, Halloween is about selling plastic gimmicks and yeah. chinese made costumes and candy and on that note mm-hmm. i think yeah. i will read a poem written in the united states of america about halloween back then which ruth edna kelly actually included in this book and it was from harper's weekly on october 31 1896 by joel benton and mm-hmm. i would tell you what halloween back then sounds fantastic so i'll just read the poem it's called halloween Pixie, cobbled, elf, and sprite, all are on their rounds tonight. In the wane moon's silver ray, thrives their helter skelter play. Fond of cellar, barn, or stack, true unto the almanac, they present to credulous eyes strange hobgoblin mysteries. Cabbage stumps, straws wet with dew, apple skins, and chestnuts too, and a mirror for some lass, show what wonders come to pass. Doors they move and gates they hide, mischiefs that on moonbeams ride. Are their deeds, and by their spells, love records its oracles. Don't we all of long ago, by the ruddy fireplace glow, in the kitchen and the hall, those queer coof like pranks recall. Every shadows were they then, but tonight they come again. Were we once more but sixteen, precious would be Halloween. And so to all of our wonderful listeners and viewers, I hope you have a very happy Halloween and remember the real meaning of the season. 